Hi guys, uh, welcome to this blog on cardiac biomarkers. So as you may have noticed, I've been doing these biochemical tests, blood tests uh, in the last few blogs. So the idea is to cover all these basic uh, lab tests that we do because I think this is not covered properly anywhere, either on uh, you know YouTube channels or in the books uh, for you guys. So I made one uh, video on LFT, then I did one on CBC and platelets I did not cover because there is a full lecture on platelets already there on our YouTube channel. Then I did one on anemia and hemoglobin. And now this one is on cardiac biomarkers. And then after that, I'll be doing on miscellaneous tests like ferritin and thyroid function tests, etc., which uh, you guys need to interpret and you come across in the ICU. If you need blood urea creatinine, let me know in the comment section because I'm not sure uh, whether you guys will benefit from blood urea creatinine. If you need a, a blog on uh, urea creatinine, just put it up in the chat box and then I will see the response. If you guys need it, I will go ahead with it. So now we move on to today's topic that is cardiac biomarkers. So first of all, I will start with HS troponin. So HS troponin is high sensitivity troponin. It is nothing but an extension of troponin test. And a high sensitivity means that it picks up levels which are very low, which are usual conventional troponin test is not able to pick up. So everything else is the same as for troponins, uh, uh, for uh, HS troponin. The advantage of picking up such micro levels of troponin is that it can detect uh, non stemi You know, when you have non uh, stemi or rather NSTACS, and you have to dif differentiate between unstable angina and uh, non stemi the only way to distinguish is actually by troponin level. So classic troponin levels may not be elevated in very small infarctions, and here your HS troponin will be elevated. So if you get that, you know you're dealing with uh, non stemi and then you can go ahead with your uh, treatment strategy. So that is the advantage of doing HS troponin I and everything else is the same as for troponin. And the lab values that you have to use are variable, they vary a little from lab to lab and test to test, you know, the way they perform the test and the level should be elevated above the upper limit of normal for that particular reference value. And you have to do two sets, three to six hours apart and demonstrate a rise in the levels. So that is how you actually go about doing HS troponin. And it is not a value really for STEMI because in STEMI, the troponin levels go very high and you will get ST elevation in your ECGs. So it is mainly to diagnose non stemi Okay, now, <clears throat> and it will be obviously be elevated in all other conditions in which troponin is elevated. So, and I will talk about troponin now. So troponin is actually we me measured as troponin I and as troponin T. And these two are proteins found in the actin myosin filaments, which are part of the cardiac cell, the cardiac myocyte. And whenever there is injury to the cardiac myocyte, uh, troponin I and troponin T are released. And the injury can be either ischemic or non-ischemic. Classically, we use troponin I or troponin T for the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. And if you do not have an elevation of troponin, you cannot diagnose acute myocardial infarction. That includes both STEMI and non-STEMI. You have to have elevation of troponin and you should do two tests, three to six hours apart, and there should be a rising trend in these uh, two tests. That is how you diagnose. And apart from the elevation of troponin, you also need one more diagnostic test or diagnostic feature, and that would be either ECG, chest pain, a coronary angiogram, or echo finding. So that is how you diagnose acute myocardial infarction. And apart from uh, acute coronary syndrome. There are many conditions, the numerous conditions can give rise to troponin uh, levels. So the distinguished feature is, is that in uh, STEMI, the levels can go very high from 10 times upper limit of normal to 100 times. And in all other conditions, you get up to 10 times only. So that is very important, the level of elevation of 
troponin 9 uh, or troponin T. And in myocarditis, yes, in you know viral myocarditis or other kinds of myocarditis, the levels can go up to 20 times. So that was about the levels and where you get troponin from and uh, uh, the role of troponin in renal failure is uh, somewhat uh, to be taken with a pinch of salt because slight elevation in renal failure can be seen normally. That is for two reasons. One, it gets excreted through the kidneys. Second, you know, when you have CKD, then uh, there is some alteration in the cardiac uh, musculature. You get uremic cardiomyopathy and there is injury to the heart muscle, cardiac myocytes, so they release troponin. That is why in renal failure, you can have slight elevation in troponins and this is mainly in CKD but like I told you there's excretion in the kid kidneys for troponins so even in AKI there will be slight false elevation. Apart from this it is also elevated in septic cardiomyopathy. So you people should know septic cardiomyopathy uh, uh, do not confuse it with the acute myocardial infarction but then again like I told you the levels will be less than 10 times upper limit of normal. And even in ARDS and pulmonary embolism, they can be elevated because of stress on the right heart. Troponin can come from the right heart also. So moving on, where else can troponin come from? So troponin also elevates in stroke. In stroke, it can elevate because there is neurogenic injury to the myocardium because these are release of catecholamines. The only other real source for troponin is muscle. You know, sometimes you get muscle injury in the acute setting like rhabdomyolysis. And here you can get elevated troponins and these troponins are actually specific to the muscle. But the prevailing tests do not distinguish the troponin I or troponin T that we do classically from the muscle troponin. So this should be borne in mind that if you're getting a troponin level and uh, the heart is normal, look at the muscle. There's something going on in the muscles. So that is, I think, uh, about all uh, for troponins. Please remember there are many conditions. Even atrial fibrillation episodes can raise it. Even you know, acute elevations in hypertension. But these will be very small levels of elevation. So that is, there's nothing more to troponin. That is about it. But be careful in its interpretation. Now we shall move on to... Uh, uh, brain uh, natriuretic peptide. So now talking about brain natriuretic peptide. Now what is it and uh, what is relevance interpretation? Brain natriuretic peptide actually is uh, a peptide, polypeptide, which is stored and released by the cardiac myocytes and uh, BNP as it is popularly known as, exists as a propeptide molecule in the form of pro-BNP. And when it is released, it is broken down into two fragments. One is BNP, one, one is NT pro BNP. So we measure actually either NT pro BNP or BNP. NT pro BNP has a higher sensitivity and specificity as compared to BNP. That is why it's the preferred test. However, it is 25% more costly. So it depends what your lab is doing. Ideally, you should go for NT pro BNP. Now, what is uh, the significance and when is it released? So, NT pro BNP, I will refer to only NT pro BNP most of the times. So, NT pro BNP is released whenever there is stress on the myocardium and it is released by the cardiac myocytes and it is not due to ischemia unlike troponin. It is released because there is stress on the heart and stress is because. Uh, of uh, uh, overload on the heart, it can be either because of systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction, but more because of systolic dysfunction whenever there's an overload on the heart. So when the BNP is released, it is actually a protective mechanism. It is supposed to really lead to release of fluids from the kidneys and to vasodilate the blood vessels, thereby unloading the heart. So it has a protective mechanism. Now, NT pro BNP is uh, having a diagnostic value in the sense that the patient presents with acute dyspnea. And uh, if you do this test of NT pro BNP, it is available you know, as a card test also in the emergencies, in the ICUs. So if the level is more than 300, you know, it helps to kind of uh, 
rule out or rule in uh, a cardiac cause of dyspnea. If the value of NT-proBNP in a patient who presents to the ICU acutely with dyspnea is less than 300, it rules out a cardiac cause with the sensitivity and specificity of more than 90%. And if the value is something like more than 900 approximately, then it is practically sure that it is a cardiac cause of dyspnea. So that is the importance in acute dyspnea. Apart from the acute setting, nd NP is elevated like I told you in so many conditions with this cardiac dysfunction, especially heart failure, then mainly systolic, though also diastolic. So all patients coming with CHF will have an elevated nd NP. However, it can be normal in early stages of acute heart failure, some in chronic heart failure sometimes, acute heart failure sometimes, and in heart diseases where there's mainly diastolic dysfunction, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or restrictive cardiomyopathy, where there is mainly diastolic dysfunction. The other thing is in renal failure, there's a false elevation, again, because it is excreted by the kidneys. And uh, there is some interference also sometimes in the measurement of NT pro BNP. Then as you age, again, NT pro BNP values rise. And different uh, values are given to patients at different age uh, values and in renal failure as per GFR. So you have to kind of know the different values. I'm not going, going to give all those values. They are available in the books. But the value, the normal value of NT pro BNP changes with age and with renal failure. And in obesity, it is falsely decreased because there's a lot of uh, fluid overload in these patients. They have more fluids, obese patients. And also because the adipocytes, they alter the metabolism of nt pro -BNP. Apart from this, nt pro -BNP, uh, is normal even in acute coronary syndrome. It does not rise in acute coronary syndrome. It remains normal. And uh, it also has a significance in the treatment. You know, with treatment of congestive heart failure, the values should start falling. If the values start falling, your treatment is being successful. And it has a prognostic value. If your NT pro BNP value is more than 3,000, 4,000, it has uh, associated with the high mortality. And, uh, you know, it, the levels correlate with your New York, New York Heart Association uh, degree of heart failure. So th those are the things about uh, NT pro BNP or BNP. BNP is also just the same, but its values are different. That is very important to realize its values are different. You cannot take the same value for NT pro BNP and BNP. The values are different, the costs are different, and the sensitivity specificity of the two tests are different but the clinical implication and connotation and interpretation is the same. So that's all friends about uh, troponin and uh, BNP, NT pro BNP. And uh, if you need any further uh, blogs, any particular topic, especially blood urea creatinine, if you want it, then I shall make it. Let me know uh, what else, put it up in the chat box, any questions. Thank you for all your support and thanks to all the guys especially who bought the super thanks and supporting us financially. Looking forward to more contributions. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Take care.